night. Man, I'm telling you what, maybe change the scenery will help me with today's message. I just, I got, I got writer's block. The Bible tells us that our temple is the body of the whole, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna make sure I'm in shape. Oh, Holy Spirit, give me some inspiration here. Give me some inspiration here for today's message, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Here we go. That's right, you won't so bad. You ain't so bad. What? What? Boom, 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 boom. He's dead! He's trying to hurt you! You gotta fight him! You gotta move! That truth is like my punch. It's gonna be a knockout! Oh. All right, it is good to be back. I hope you guys had a great week. I hope you got into Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Hope you guys are ready, but if you're not, we are ready to go. So, um, let's get right into our lesson here. Now, Ecclesiastes was written at the end of Solomon's life. Uh, the, the Bible tells us that Solomon reigned as king for about 40 years, um, so we do know that, but we're not exactly sure when he started his reign. So the historians um, kind of figure that he was somewhere between 60 to 70 years old. Now, as Solomon's life is winding down, as he's getting older, he begins wrapping up his thoughts. And these last two chapters seem to be written with a younger person in mind. He's As an older man, he's kind of looking back at what he would do at the start of his life so that he could run it better. So Solomon looks not only at that which he's experienced personally, the mistakes and things he has done, but also what he has experienced indirectly, what he has noticed in the lives of others, the mistakes that they have made. And he begins to share insights on how to live life better. Now, I, I wanna say it again because Solomon has been very clear, life under the sun is difficult. Solomon has been crystal clear about that. This world will remain imperfect. This world will remain imperfect. There's nothing you can do to make it perfect. It will remain imperfect until the perfect comes. And that perfect is the return of Jesus Christ. He will come and he will restore what sin has ruined. And he will come and he will rule and reign in righteousness. But until then, we're stuck in an imperfect world. Solomon, though, is going to share some tips and how we can run. Run? Are we in PE class? Running? I heard running was bad for your joints. That's why I stay in shape doing jazzercise. What kind of shape is that? <laughs> A circle? Well, perhaps someone needs to revisit our last message, our last lesson. Uh, kind words, please. Thank you. Things that edify and build each other up. Sorry, man. Apparently my mouth is doing too much running. I think my tongue has a little too much sassercise. Dude, I forgive you. All right, so let's get back into our lesson. The Bible refers to life as a race. There's several verses that do that. Hebrews 11, 6 says, run or live life with endurance. And 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, run, live life as to win, do your best. And Philippians 2, 16 says, I did not run, live life in vain. I lived with purpose. But I want you to listen carefully to the words of Paul. This is the last letter that he wrote. So he is at the end of his life. He is in a Roman prison and he is waiting his execution. Historians say that he was beheaded during the reign of Nero. And this is what he says in 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have lived my life. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Solomon wants to help us help you run our race to live our life. He wants to share some tips on how to run and how to live life better. 
Now in a race, it is always better to get a good start. If you are a sprinter, it's uh, so important you get out of the blocks well. And even if you're running the kind of the mid distant races, the 400s and the 800s, it's important to get a good start so you can get into your stride right away. And if you are in a distant race, if you're running those long distance, the cross country races, it's so important that you get a good start. I remember my daughter Molly was uh, a cross country runner and she would hate for me to say this, but she actually, uh, her team ran varsity, got uh, fourth in state, so she did very well, but she was running a race and um, she did not get a good start. She didn't get out in front of the pack and what happened was she got knocked down. And she got trampled on. And I remember I was at kind of at a point and I knew where she was supposed to kind of be. And I was like, man, where is she? And then where is she? And then where is she? And sure enough, here she came at the very uh, back of the, of, of the pack because she'd gotten knocked over. Unfortunately, she actually really ran a good race. Her split for the two and three miles were excellent. But because she didn't get a good start, it really made her race difficult. So with that being said, let's get into ready, set, go, Ecclesiastes 11, and we're going to go one through four. So here we go. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disasters may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. So that's 11, 1 through 4. Casting bread on the waters. Solomon like feeding the ducks or something? Okay, now we got to remember Ecclesiastes was written as a book of poetry. Solomon is using words to create imagery so that we can see some important spiritual principles and truth. Solomon wants us to see right here, wants to paint a picture, the importance of giving, of sharing, right? Of casting. And what he wants to say is early on, right, to start your race as a young person, uh, we need to learn how to be generous, getting in the habit of sharing. And that doesn't happen naturally. I want you to think about even little kids. When we had um, our children, I will tell you that their favorite toy was usually the toy that someone else was playing with. And then once they began to play with it, they didn't care about it. They just didn't want someone else to play with it. We see that. Think about Nemo. Remember the uh, seagulls, mine, 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 mine. We tend to operate that way. Solomon wants us to run our race better. He wants us to get a good start. And so he wants us to resist uh, being selfish early on to develop good habits, especially as it pertains to our things and our stuff. So let's make it real. I did some research and the average Christian in the United States shares gives 2.5% of their money, just 2.5. Now the Bible in the Old Testament talks about a tithe that is 10%. So if all Christians just gave 10%, now I want you to think about that 10%, that means you get 90, it's all God's, you get 90, you're only sharing or giving 10%. But look at what, the, what would happen. If every Christian gave 10% here in America, the church would have an extra 165 billion, let's say that again, billion dollars. And let's put that in perspective. One billion dollars, all overseas missions is taken care of. So our job to go out and get the word to the ends of the earth would be taken care of and those missionaries who struggle so hard wouldn't have to struggle because it would just take a billion dollars. For $25 billion, we could end all starvation and death um, by preventable diseases. So many people die because they just don't have medicines and, anti and, and um, antibiotics for simple diseases. We have the cure. We have the food. We just can't get it to them because we don't have the resources. $25 billion ends it. $15 billion solves the clean water problem and the sanitation that makes so much of the water that the world drinks undrinkable because sewage and things seep into it. That problem could be solved with $15 billion. So here's the reality. 
we would still have $125 billion left over. How much better place would this world be if we just learned right off the bat to give? There's health benefits, right? Psalm is saying, start early giving. And, and here's what we're finding out now. In science, they're now saying that there is health benefits to those who are generous with their money and their time, those who share and give, those who volunteer, those who are giving, sharing, who are casting their bread. Uh, here's what they say. Uh, lower risk of depression, lower blood pressure. They are just plain happier and they actually live longer lives. These are statistics, right? Here's what they're noticing, that giving is placed in the same category as your diet, as your exercise, and your sleep. It's one of the core things that increase your ability to live long and to enjoy life. Psalm is saying is get in a good habit right off the bat. If you're going to run your race better, get a good start, you must learn to be generous and share, to, to give, to tithe. See, the billion dollar question, or should I say the $165 billion question is, how well are you starting your race? How well? Greedy people are always worried about their money, and when you are worried about your money, here's the reality, you're never gonna have enough money. You're just not, and that will weigh you down and will just suck the joy out of life's moments because you're so worried about your possessions and your money. So uh, let's, I want you to see, we're going to go into Hebrews 11.1 1 again. So cast your bread upon the water, share, be generous, for you will find it after many days. So for you will find it. What is Solomon saying about that bread, for you will find it? Soggy bread? Maybe he's just using bread to catch fish. You are actually onto something there. Solomon has noticed that being generous has a way of not only blessing the person that you give, but also it blesses the, the, the person that you gave to, but also blesses you, yourself. Doing the right thing for the right reason makes you feel right. I'm gonna say that again. Doing the right thing for the right reason will always make you feel right. I can promise you that I get much more excitement and enjoyment spending my money on others and doing something nice than I do for myself. I was thinking we had, uh, I drive a school bus and I was doing my route and uh, with all of this um, COVID-19 um, coronavirus, people had lost jobs and where I was driving my route, we deliver food and there was a person there who um, had lost their job and I was telling Miss Christine about that. And so she said, man, someone gave me, or she goes, I, ha I happen to have a $100 bill. And so she gave that to me and said, why don't you give it to that lady? So the next day as I ran the route, um, she came up to get the food and I said, I have something for you. And I, I kind of came out and just said, man, the Lord is with you. I know this is a hard time. Um, this is just a little something that I had. It's not much, but, but here, and, and we gave her that. And so here's the reality. As she um, just received it and was so grateful, I was moved. I, I promise you, I got more enjoyment out of it. And then her little son uh, brought up a note the next day just thanking us for it. And I promise you, there's nothing that I could have purchased that would have brought that same sense of satisfaction, fulfillment as it was to be um, used by the Lord, to have him work through us to bless someone else with that what he's blessed us with. Remember, he pours into us so that we can pour out. And that's where your happiness is, not in hoarding like the Scrooge, but in sharing. All right, so let's move on. We're going to move down to 11.2. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. Now, Solomon wants us to realize at the start of our race, ready, life under the sun, the importance of saving, of putting money away in different areas so that you will be uh, in, the, in the stock, that they say, being diversified, to save and be diversified, not putting all of your eggs in one basket right, in different areas so that you will be prepared for the unfortunate events that make up life under the sun. Life will surprise you and things will pop up that you're not planning. And Solomon is saying, get in a good habit of 
sharing your money and in saving your money. Solomon has noticed that young people, and I want you to think about your life, I know I was the same way, are really good at spending money. Raise your hand if you are good at spending money. It comes naturally. But we must develop good habits early at the start of our race to be wise with their money. Share it, save it, and then spend it. I'm going to say it again. Share it, save it, and then spend it. So let's make it real. Do you share do you share? Do you save? How much money do you have saved? It's funny downstairs here at our church, down in the vineyard, the little kids, um, they actually do a better job of tithing than the older kids. And here's really why, because little kids get money from mom and dad. Mom and dad want to teach them that principle and then they kind of drop in as they get older. It's really about you and your allowance and what you do and whether you're sharing your money. And what ends up happening is, is we don't share our money because there's too many things we want to buy. And we talked earlier on in some of the other lessons, Solomon knows you buy things and remember others enjoy it because you give it up to goodwill because you don't even care about it anymore. Here's the reality. As you are young, you learn to give and you learn to tithe at the beginning of your race. And if everybody did that, we just talked what? The adult church doesn't want. What? It doesn't give. Well, why? Because they didn't learn at the beginning of the race to get into that good habit. We're going to talk about habits in just a second. So let's move down uh, 11, 3, and 4. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. So we've got wind, we've got clouds. What is Solomon saying here? Solomon, the meteorologist? Solomon is obviously talking about how the wind and the rain are going to slow you down. Duh. That is why I do jazzercise. I don't even have to be concerned with the weather. Solomon is pointing out the importance of starting the race. Just starting. He is sharing the truth about how dangerous procrastination is. Wind, clouds, these are all temporary things that come and go. Situations that are constantly changing. And they can make life more difficult. Let's be honest. No one likes to run or do anything with the wind in their face. It's exhausting. And rain. Think about that. Even sporting events cancel so many events. And then those that aren't canceled, it makes it very difficult to do what we can normally do. It makes it hard. Solomon is trying to share here is that life in this fallen world is not perfect Remember, it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. So if you're waiting for the perfect moment in a non-perfect world, guess what? You're going to be waiting forever because situations and circumstances are always going to come up that can keep us from starting. But here's the problem. If we never start something, well, we're never going to be able to finish it. You can't finish something you haven't started. So Solomon says, be careful not to look for excuses not to do. Easy to do that. I can give a million reasons because the truth is it is not hard to find reasons why today's not a good day, why I can't do it. Reasons and excuses. We can always find a reason to start to begin to wait for tomorrow. We'll, we'll just do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. Tomorrow, you're always a day away. Very good. That's right. But the problem is tomorrow never comes. Just like that song, just like Annie said, it's always a day away. Solomon is encouraging us to get a good start, to seize the moment and to not be afraid. We don't have to be perfect. Here's the, the reality. Mistakes will be made. I'm going to say it again. Listen, mistakes will be made. Life under the sun, mistakes are part of life under the sun. Mistakes are part of growing up. In learning, God works through mistakes to teach us, to correct us, to build us up, and to strengthen us. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He works through life's difficult moments and mistakes. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I love this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And here's what he's saying. You are going to do things and if you acknowledge him, he's going to straighten your path because you're going to get off. You're going to make mistakes, but he's got you. That's the goodness of God's grace. So that said, let's finish up today's message and we are going to go to verse 10. We're going to wrap it up. Verse 10. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. And so here is what Solomon is saying. Remove vexation. That is things that cause you bitterness and frustration and to put away pain. Stop doing things that are not good for you. Stop doing things that make life more difficult, that can hurt you emotionally or physically, right? We talk about dating and those things that can hurt you when you're not right emotionally, right? Stop doing those things. Stop doing things that are not good for your body that don't help you. Here's really what Solomon is saying. He's talking about bad habits. Someone's talking about the bad habits and the reality that we need to deal with those issues when we're young, in our youth. Why we are young. Why? Because the longer we wait to deal with those issues, the harder it is to break those habits off. And the longer we wait to deal with those issues, the more damage they cause in our life. It is impossible, Solomon has noticed, to start our race well when we are plagued by bad habits, right? The sin that so easily entangles us, as it says in Hebrews, to cast and to lay that aside. Why? So that we can run our race well. So let's, let's make it real as we wrap today's message up. Ask the Holy Spirit just to show you during the course of the week, during your quiet time, some bad habits that need to be changed and maybe some good habits that need to be started. Remember, tomorrow's dreams, they begin today. And that's what Solomon is saying. Today, we begin that race and we begin moving to where God wants us. But that starts today as we run our race as to win. Don't miss out on all that God desires for you to experience because you are not prepared. Be wise, be ready, and start your race well so that you can experience all that God has in store for you as he works in you, with you, through you, and for you. So that is today's message. Hope you guys have a great week. We will be finishing our series our next time together. So read ahead to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We'll look forward to it. God bless and see you then.